but follow me, what is a disciple of Jesus? You know, we live in a culture where people are following something. So, you know, some people are following themselves because they got it all together and they don't need anybody else. But a lot of us will follow some, something um, on, on YouTube or on all the social media platforms um, or even offline. Our family member, um, one of our parents, uh, friends, or even strangers. We're, you know, some of it's simple, some of it's more serious, but uh, we're learning um, we're following people for entertainment. We're following people because we want to learn something, uh, just maybe something simple, or we want to figure out how to do something. We want to learn something bigger outside of ourselves. Um, and, and sometimes as we're following people, we, we, there's influence that happens. You know, we're learning from them. We're applying that to our lives. And sometimes we have that effect on other people as well. We influence. Some people are following us. Maybe not millions of subscribers on YouTube or social ma- media platforms online, right? But there's family, there's friends, there's coworkers, there's kids in your own household that are influenced by you that follow you. And uh, there's more serious influences out there in our day and age, right, Um, that we might even call that they have disciples of them. We don't use that terminology. Some of the religious uh, elements of that concept are taken out. We don't we don't use those words disciple, but there's some serious disciples, right? We have disciples in our in our culture of athletes. You know, if if someone's one of the best in in athletics, we call them the GOAT. Right. Not because they're old, not because they look like a goat, but they use the acronym. If you're not familiar with sports, G-O-A-T, the greatest of all time, the goat in a certain sport. Right. We have Michael Jordan's probably one of the most famous in 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 sports that, you know, people are a disciple of like his style, what what he wears, how he plays his game. There was a, a Gatorade commercial that, you know, I want to be like Mike. We have disciples in, in sports teams. You know, we get the gear, um, our whole schedule, our money, whatever it is they're doing, we want to know what they're doing, we want to follow, and we want to be a part of it. Schedules, it doesn't matter. Like, if when they're playing, we're focused in, we're dialed in. We have disciples of celebrities and, um, and stars, right? We just, there's so many I could list, but Beyonce is one. Like, her her fashion or her music style there's followers of her they don't call themselves disciples but there's like the the be, the bay hive they call them and if you, you say anything against her on social media you will get attacked and they will defend beyonce oprah is another one that comes to mind she's kind of been on the sidelines for for some time but there's this oprah effect that she's had for years if she recommends a book if she recommends you know, some type of product, this, this person, whoever's attached to this is going to be a multimillionaire. People are going to be influenced when she says something's good. And uh, we have disciples of product companies, as you guys know, there's Apple disciples, there's uh, Android, Tesla, there's so many we could list that we want to be in the the latest know-how of uh, technology. You know, at, at the basic level, a disciple is someone who learns from someone in order to be like them, right? And this concept, this word disciple was very common in the first century um, time period. You know, the Christians during that time period, if Jesus was to say someone's a disciple, they would know exactly what that meant, right? Um, This is a common concept in the ancient world. Plato in the ancient Greek world had disciples. Confucius in the ancient uh, Middle, um, not Middle East, but Far East had disciples. And of course, why we're here today and what we acknowledge is that Jesus had disciples. In the New, T- New Testament, depending on the translation when you're looking at it, follower of Jesus are called Christians three times, but they didn't call themselves that. Other people saw what they were doing and who they were, and they called them Christians a few times we see in the New Testament. We see the, this terminology of followers of the way six times, believers 15 times, and we see disciples 235 times. And that was only in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, 
in John and in the book of Acts, we see this terminology of disciples. Paul, interestingly enough, kind of went away from that word, not because he was against it. I think it was just a popularity thing and just terminology. He didn't use disciples that much, but the actual term that we're talking about doesn't matter. It really matters if we're talking about disciples, if we're talking about followers of Jesus, if we're talking about Christians, we're talking about the same thing. And what really matters is the reality of someone's life. What, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be a disciple? And that's the main goal of this message is what is it to be a disciple of Jesus? And if you turn with me and follow along, you have it in your Bible app or some other way. Our main passage that we're going to talk through today is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And just kind of as a background before, before I read this, um, just the kind of the, the, the events that happened leading up to this moment that Jesus is talking to, to his disciples. We just experienced just a few weeks ago, Easter, the resurrection, right? Early on Sunday, the resurrection happened. There was this huge earthquake after this, and an angel of the Lord came on to where Jesus was buried. He removed the tomb, the tomb and he was sitting on top, and he freaked out the, the soldiers that were in front of the tomb. The Bible says they were so scared that they, were, they just dropped into this dead faint. They were just paralyzed with fear. And then a few women came that were going to do some preparations for Jesus's body that was, that was part of customs. And the angel of the Lord said, hey, go and tell the other disciples what was already promised before, that this Jesus, that the Jesus is alive. He has risen. And so they went and then the guards woke up from being paralyzed and freaked out. They decide to go tell the religious leaders of what happened. Uh, we were supposed to be guarding this. Uh, something's happened. He's not there anymore. We saw this angel. We don't know what's happening. And so you would think with this new evidence that the religious leaders would go and examine what was happening. Maybe they got it wrong. But no, they doubled down and they had a hardness of heart of not believing, even with this new evidence, and they told the soldiers to lie. And they paid them off. And this story spread that the disciples of Jesus are the ones that stole his body. And so this lie, they continue on. And so the disciples did what they were told from the women. And they met with Jesus right now uh, on this passage that we're about to read up on a mountain. And this is what Jesus says to them. Jesus came and told his disciples I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. God bless his word. So this, this passage right here is known as the Great Commission, right? There's the great commandments that we have. Someone asked Jesus, you know, can you summarize all the commandments? There's so many laws. There's so many commandments. Can you summarize them? He said, yes. He said, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And a second is important to love others as yourself. Though that's the great commandments. And this is known as the Great Commission. It's great because it, I love it because it gives us this big picture of what the church is to be about, what disciples are to be about. And it summarizes it here in this one passage. And it's great also because Jesus commissioned it, right? And what does it mean to commission something? He's entrusting it, this mission, this, this, um, this outcome, these instructions to his followers. Jesus is commissioning it for, for the church. This is a big picture of what we're to be about. And it says, how much authority does Jesus have? You know, Jesus is kind of flexing here, you know, in a, in a holy way. He's not sinning. He's not. He's flexing a little bit. 
And he's reminding the disciples once again that all authority, like as if all the miracles he did, the uh, predictions he made that came true, and then dying and coming back to life, if that wasn't enough, he's saying, I'm reminding you, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And so it's something when we hear that, that maybe we should listen, right? Maybe he's got something important to say. Maybe it's something that we should pay attention to and follow. And that's what he's saying as well. And the important question for us today is, what is this Great Commission? It's, it's, it's right here in front of us. What is God calling us to? And what helps us kind of with this focus is, is when we look at some of the old, um, the old language, the Greek that this was written in, we see that in Greek, there's, there's certain words that are command verbs, and there's some that are supporting verbs. And so we have all these verbs that are in this passage, go, make disciples, baptize, and teach. And all of them are interconnected with each other, but in Greek, there's one that is the command. And most would assume that go is, is the main command, commanding verb. But in reality, it's making disciples. Go could actually be translated in the original language as, as you are going, make disciples, baptize, teaching them all these commands. And so the call of the church, what we're to be about is to make disciples. And sometimes we forget that, right? Sometimes it takes everything that we have. And I was reminded of it this week of being a husband and failing being a parent and failing, being in the, in the workplace and failing, um, being, you know, a neighbor and failing from time to time. It's hard enough just to be a disciple, let alone figuring out how to make disciples. It's tough. Sometimes the things that Jesus calls us, sometimes we have a, uh, a misunderstanding of what it means to be a disciple, but God help us. And this is one of the things that Jesus is calling to and, and his passages is telling us as well that he'll be with us. And this is what he's calling us to. So I have three points for us today to help us kind of define what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And the first point is that before we disciple others, we must be a disciple. And we've kind of talked about that a little bit. And that seems pretty obvious but when you're talking about your kids or you're talking about your neighbors, we never want to assume that somebody is. And, and this passage that, that came from Jesus, he's assuming who he's talking to are disciples and their job is to go and to make disciples. And so we have to make sure before we can teach them all these new things that they actually get and understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Right. Jesus often in, in other passages, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do what I, what I say? And so that's really humbling at times. And so there is examples throughout the New Testament where it seems like people are followers of Jesus, but they're not. The heart hasn't been changed. Their actions are not showing. And even many times we'll talk to people like, I believe, I believe in God. I believe he's in real. I believe he's real. But even the, the New Testament tells us that even demons believe that Jesus is the Son of God. One, some of them on, on certain occasions were getting cast out, possessing other people, and Jesus called them out. And, he, and they said, you, are you coming to torment us? Are you coming to, 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 to destroy us? And demons even believe. We have the example of one of the followers, one of the 12 of Jesus, Judas. On most of, of the accounts, he's following, he's doing what he's supposed to do, but he's the one that betrayed Jesus. He wasn't a true follower of Jesus. In John chapter 6, and we'll look at that a little bit today, there's people that were following, that were learning, that were part of the fan club of Jesus but when they heard some of these hard teachings, and there's other hard teachings of Jesus, they, they abandoned him. They didn't want to follow as well. And so it's important for us to, to make sure that we're in a real relationship with Christ, that we're really in the heart and in our actions. We understand what it is to be a follower. And so some of this is, is um, not new news to you if you're a follower of Jesus, but be thinking about some of these elements. 
if you have the opportunity to talk to someone else as well about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a disciple. And first and foremost, to become a Christian, to become a disciple, they need to hear the good news. Sometimes we, we call that and the Bible calls that the gospel. We need to know what that means. They need to hear it. You know, faith comes from hearing the word of God and they need to understand it, right? And so we need to have conversations with people if they, and ask them if they sense a need for Jesus. And we live in a day and age where they're like, what, why do I need Jesus? I'm doing my own thing. I'm trying to be a good person, whatever. But this is an important question because if you really understand you need, a, um, you need Jesus, then you understand that you need a savior, that you understand that there's a holy God and that we have been separated from him because of our sins, that Jesus died on the cross because of our sins. And so it starts with this need of Jesus. And then we repent just like Jesus tells us to. We repent and we turn from our sins and our turn from our old lifestyle and we go to God for forgiveness.